life in space. You, <laughs> you might expect something like this, uh, but in the solar system, I might disappoint you. We were looking for possibly something like this. This little guy we found uh, in a lake in Antarctica. Uh, so it's a microbe. So it's a good example of life uh, that needs the minimum prerequisites to survive, to live. Uh, and when you hear about life, of course, the next thing you, you, uh, that comes to mind is water. So the search for life in the solar system becomes the search also for water in the solar system. But where can we then find water in the solar system? Of course, we can find water in our favorite planet, planet Earth. But why is water there and not elsewhere? Planet um, Earth is in the exactly the right distance where uh, water can remain liquid. So it's exactly at the right distance from the sun where water does not evaporate because it's too close to the sun, like Mercury is, for example, and it's not too far away from the sun and water does not remain frozen like the, the giant planets. Uh, so it's exactly the perfect distance. Uh, but let's have a closer look at the giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, however. So, that's a, so those are the moon systems of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter and Saturn, they have um, each some big moons and some smaller moons, in total around 60 each, and they orbit those planets in nice uh, orbits around them. And those moons you can see here compared to, to the Earth. That's our nice Earth and that's the Earth's moon. Um, Jupiter and Saturn, you can see their moons um, organized there. And uh, we are going actually to look further for looking for life into Europa and uh, Enceladus. They are the most promising candidates and we will talk about why right now. So this up here is Enceladus, this is Europa. So you can see um, Enceladus consists of a rocky core, of a layer of a liquid water ocean around that rocky core, and a uh, ice crust that is around uh, 10 to 30 kilometers thick, uh, even thinner at some point. You can even see here on the South Pole, we have found that there are uh, geysers coming out from the ocean and they go all the way very high to, into space. And uh, a similar structure for Europa here. And also we have very strong indications that there are geysers also on Europa. Um, but then why does this water remain liquid so far away from the sun? It should be frozen, right? Uh, well, to explain this, we, uh, we need to have tidal forces. So we all know that the moon um, pulls on the Earth and it deforms the Earth in the way that uh, it pulls the ocean and then we have the tides that we know. You can see that very nicely here. So in place of the moon, imagine having this giant planet in the center of its own uh, moon system pulling on each of the moons. So the moons are in turn, they are deformed like this, the red part here. But not only that, but also the moons, they do not have perfectly circular orbits. They go a tiny bit further at some point in the orbit and a tiny bit closer at other points. So they are deformed in different ways throughout their orbit because of this distance differ difference. So um, you can imagine that this kind of deformation, when you have a rocky core like this, means that the rocky core deforms and uh, becomes smaller and bigger, and then you have friction in the rocky core. So you have heat generated that is translated, you know, it's transferred into the ocean and uh, it's maintained liquid. And you can even see here a red hot core for Europa in this nice picture. And that's where, how you have uh, energy. So apart from water, what, uh, what else are we looking for when we're looking for life? So in th those nice worlds, what else uh, should there be in order for life to exist? Uh, apart from water, we, there should be uh, energy, which there is, but also energy that can be used for life, uh, for metabolism, for, from, for basic life, and uh, basic chemistry, so some chemical components that are also needed for life. So when you look for these things, essentially we're saying that you're looking for the habitability of those planets, so that makes those planets habitable. But uh, to look for life, of course you can look for life, so that means 
looking for the signatures of existing habitats. So if land is habitable, and then possibly it has uh, ecosystems of microbes, and they produce various signatures, which you can then um, find, you can then sense. So how can we look for those two things then? First of all, uh, with remote sensing, which is a fancy way of saying looking from far away, from space, and already that's a nice picture of uh, Europa from far, and you can already see geological characteristics, and this is a picture of Enceladus. So even from this picture that is from far away, you can see uh, indications of, um, of activity and of oceans. That is, you can see first you have a crater, um, a crater side, crater part, and a part that looks very much like uh, the glaciers on Earth with uh, fresh material. And what craters mean in planetary science mean that this uh, surface is very old. So it's from an era in the, in the solar system where a lot of bombardment by meteorites was common. And that means the surface is old. This tells us no craters, the surface is new. So there's processes, geological processes, glacial processes. So that indicates towards an ocean. Um, even when you take closer pictures, you can see very interesting things. This is a picture of the South Pole of Enceladus with the canyons here. Uh, this is a picture from Europa with rifts. It all looks very glacial, like it does on Earth, so it also tells you a lot about uh, the geology of those places. You can make 3D pictures from uh, stereo images, taking a picture from one side and a picture from somewhere else. You combine those two pictures. Uh, you can also do, you can see the different colors here. You can analyze chemicals there because of those colors. And of course, uh, pictures of the plumes. Very impressive, uh, very dramatic. This is, was taken from uh, Cassini around 2005, the Cassini spacecraft that is in orbit around Saturn. And this shows that you have something active, an active ocean underneath. Uh, it's very impressive. You can also use radar. So you, uh, you sense the ocean with radar. You can see the interfaces, uh, how deep the, 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 the cell is, the ice cell. Um, and then you can constrain your, your ocean models. And also magnetometry. So those giant planets, they have magnetic fields. Those fields are modified by the moons. And uh, the way they are modified, if you have a magnetometer flying around, it can tell you a lot about the internal structure of the moon. And there's also other ways, but those are the most common, let's say. The second way is uh, in situ measurements, which is essentially going there and taking samples straight away. And uh, of course, this is can be used more to, uh, to when, you know, whenever there's something, uh, a chemical you need to uh, detect, then you, know, you go there and you, you sample that chemical. So this is the cutout, your typical cutout of an icy moon. You have the ocean, the icy cell, transport mechanisms, either plumes or glacial, and the surface. And in green, we indicate places where either you have a habitat, possible habitat in the bottom, and also the interface, or you have places where signatures from life are either trapped or transported to the surface and then we can detect them. So this tells us that we can use specific uh, types of spacecraft to go to visit each of those places and uh, sample them for biosignatures. I'll talk to you in more detail about them. First, we can make a plume fly through. So a plume, when scientists discovered it, they were very happy. It means essentially you can get a free sample very likely from the ocean. Uh, so what you can do is you can fly through them and you can capture particles in ballistic gel essentially because you have very high speeds. And you can analyze this, um, these particles either on the spot or you can ever, even bring them back to Earth to be analyzed uh, in laboratories. Second, you have a um, soft lander. Soft lander is what uh, we are familiar with from the Apollo 11 mission, uh, where they land on the moon, Neil Armstrong. Uh, but there, they had you know, a pilot on board, and it was uh, piloting the, the lander, so it could avoid obstacles and stuff. So over there, uh, it's, this is not possible, first of all, because um, it takes the signal, uh, the, the electromagnetic signal that is needed to 
to drive this, uh, three hours back and forth to Saturn, and one hour to Jupiter. So you cannot really do it from Earth. Uh, so everything has to be done uh, autonomously. So this thing is essentially, essentially a flying robot where it uh, finds its own position by taking pictures of the environment. It also senses the environment for hazards, and it also can fly to different places according to what it knows. So eventually you land, and once you land you have something like this, a lander that looks like this, and you can sample the surface and the near subsurface about, uh, you know, for chemicals that have been transported from the ocean. Um, a cheap and dirty, let's say, fast and dirty, not cheap. Um, spacecraft, uh, a cheap and uh, fast and dirty uh, soft lander is this. It's called a penetrator. Essentially, it's a bullet-shaped um, probe. And what you have to do is you have to release it in orbit, um, deorbit, so decelerate until it falls, and then it goes into the ice. It uh, buries itself in, at high impact speed, uh, maybe five meters below the surface, and that is a fast way, cheap way, to, um, to, uh, to sample those depths. So at five meters, um, the sample quality is better, so we can send this, this, uh, this thing there. A uh, further, more complicated way is a uh, shallow melting probe. So this is a cutout of the plumes of Enceladus. You have the canyon, the plumes, and the plume source. So it's like a geyser on Earth, essentially. And at this point, there's always a depth where the water is liquid before it becomes gas. So what if you land here and melt through here to sample water where it's liquid, and maybe you can find there are microbes that are still alive or there's still metabolism with active metabolism, so that would be great. So you have first a soft lander, that's um, the same soft lander as before, that's actually where I was working in the beginning of my PhD. And you have on its side uh, a melting probe, right here. Uh, the melting probe is here, it looks like this, and this is the logo of uh, the project I was working on, which without saying I put here, because it actually shows the, um, the concept very nicely, the operation concept. You land, you drill, you sense liquid water. And those are uh, tests from Antarctica. So this is the, the melting probe, and this is the, the colleagues I was working with from other universities. So they were, they were even testing it, and they're still working on this. And the, let's say the most sci-fi concept of all is this, a submarine that uh, goes into the ocean and looks around for life. That is a fancy way of uh, showing this. And what I like about this is that they are actually building a submarine that is, really looks like a squid, so I find this funny in a way. And the idea is to uh, land on the icy moon, drill through the ice with this probe right here, uh, and then swim in the ocean, go to the bottom, and uh, look for life where it's very like, well, you know, it's more likely to be around hot sources on the bottom of the sea of the ocean. So we have curious squid here, who's asking, so has this been done already? What are you talking about? Uh, some of it, yes. So from the 70s, we have had missions that have flown by the giant planets or have been in orbit. Those are their names. Uh, that's those in the 70s and this is actually um, going to be deorbited uh, in, a, in a month or something. It's going to fly into the, uh, the atmosphere of Saturn. Um, and also, no, the most advanced stuff uh, is now being designed and now uh, being proposed to fly. So when should uh, we expect results from all this? To say, to hear a positive yes about uh, life in the solar system. Um, yeah, we should wait around the 2030s. That's when, you know, until you plan the mission, it takes seven years, three, three to seven years to go there. That's a long time, so um, it will take a bit, but it will be possibly, you know, the, one of the biggest um, discoveries of mankind that, you know, it will be, it will change the way we see the universe and we see ourselves in the universe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Costas. Are there some questions? Uh, uh, yes, please.
Are there any precautions that uh, we should take before taking any samples from, from, from this uh, news? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question, actually. There's a policy that the agencies apply, uh, NASA is all of them. It's called planetary protection. And it focuses on microorganisms that, you know, if you're sending things into sensitive environments, that means it has to be a certain, you know, um, clean up to a certain, certain level. So it's a very real possibility that you take a microbe from Earth that survives seven years of space, survives long, survives vacuum, and uh, then you can find you know, a nice warm ocean and populate and really contaminate that environment. And it also goes the other way around. So when I spoke about um, sample return, essentially you can bring the sample from those worlds and those sam this sample can do, you know, can be based on another type of DNA, it's another type of life, we can do maybe damage here. So it goes both ways and it's, uh, agencies are taking, taking care of this. Yes, please. What kind of uh, mechanisms do you use to analyze those samples? To analyze, uh, it's a certain uh, set of instruments. So uh, spectrometers, microscopes even, uh, antibody arrays, uh, anything you have in a biology lab, I think you can, is, is, uh, you can consider uh, miniaturizing and making appropriate for, for space uh, to take there. Yeah, please. Um. Do you believe in aliens from <laughs> extraterrestrial I mean, they're, they're in the first picture, so... so. <laughs> no, I'm joking, sorry. Uh, actually, they... Uh, I mean, that's another, uh, another aspect of this search. So you're, there's life in the solar system, which is going to be microbial. And then there's like, they look around for life around the exoplanets, with their planets they're discovering around stars. Um, so there you can look if, an, if a planet around the star has an atmosphere and if that atmosphere has biosignatures like methane or ozone or stuff like that. And there's a third aspect where uh, they're listening in, it's called SETI, you may be familiar with that. Uh, they're listening in for, let's say, signs of advanced civilizations like uh, radio uh, signals. So this is, let's say, the search for microbial life in the solar system, which would be still groundbreaking if Confirmed. You found. Wait, do you believe? Just believe. Ah. I mean, you know, belief. But can you search for something which uh, you don't believe in? I mean, you know, my heart is very dedicated to this, so partially yes would be my question, my answer to your question. Okay, let's move on. Thanks very much, Costas. Thank yeah. you.